Okay, so the AE of Galair, August Falja, the Dian Crinu Show. Hello and, and welcome. Welcome to this meeting. Um, my name is Fidelma Butler. Um, I work at the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences at UCC. That's, that's the, the long bit. So I am an ecologist and together with um, my colleague Pat Muir, we have been involved with the LIFE project since the start. Now, one of the uh, primary aims of the project is to make new and existing information on the natural heritage of the region available and, of course, useful also to the people that, that live there. You know, we want to explore ways in, in which this information um, or, or knowledge, I suppose, of, of things like the flora and the fauna and the geology um, can be leveraged to produce useful outputs um, and useful products that will enhance things like uh, tourism ventures, education initiatives, um, and also to enhance and support well-being. Okay, so, so we have we plan to have what we call a series of knowledge gathering programs. And these really are projects that will gather information new and existing um, on the region. And these will be used to create, uh, as I say, um, useful products. Now, I, I need not point out what uh, a beautiful place is the Ivora, uh, rich in cultural and natural heritage. So of course, we were faced with the question of where to start, you know, where, where to begin, what, what elements of the natural heritage should we focus on? And how were we to decide that? And of course, the answer was fairly straightforward. And the first thing was to ask uh, the people who live in the region. All right. So, of course, when the project began, we planned uh, lots of face to face meetings with interested people and with community groups. And of course, you know, the, the holding of these face to face open meetings. Um, was entirely scuppered by the, the COVID-19, as, as is clearly obvious. But nevertheless, like the rest of humanity, um, we have embraced the digital world and we have been consulting and having conversations online. Now, this online survey uh, that Sally is going to tell you about is one of the ways in which we have gathered ideas and opinions from people right across the peninsula. And, and, and these ideas you know, will be used to, to underpin the, the knowledge gathering projects as we, as we run in the, in the project. Sally has taken information from this survey and has analyzed and presented it and will present it, I think, in a most engaging and informative way. Now, we have already commenced um, a number of knowledge gathering projects. Uh, so one is looking at the winter activity of the chuff, uh, that iconic word. Uh, one is uh, building and assembling um, resources uh, to create a that calendar, you know, for the region, uh, resources like that. And another is looking back at the ancient environments um, and how they relate to, you know, the, the tetrapod activity along the coast. So this are knowledge gathering programs and will also help us to identify uh, knowledge gaps. The information, as I say, that gain, gained during the survey will help us chart how we move forward with the remainder of the knowledge gathering programs and will help us to gather information, you know, the information that will be of most use uh, and, and most benefit. So, Sorry, Fidelma, I think you froze there slightly just at the end. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. I presume you were just segueing into Sally's presentation. I really was, yes. And that's, I had a feeling, I'm delighted I actually managed to get through all of that without my internet going down. It is a bit wobbly. <laughs> um, no, that was a lovely introduction. So thank you. Okay, and, so and yes. So we'll have Sally's presentation now anyway. Very good. Hi everyone, um, my name is Soli and one I, I'm one of the knowledge gatherers at LIVE and I'm just going to share my screen now so I can 
share the results of the survey with you. There you go. Okay, I hope you can see. Um, okay, so as some of you might know, we ran a survey earlier this year on environmental knowledge among local communities in the Ibra. And yeah, this presentation is just the results of that. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about just a brief introduction to the research and the study in the survey, um, linking the research questions to the survey questions, and then sharing um, some of the major results with you. And then at the end, I'll touch a bit upon what we can do with this information going forward. So just a brief overview of the study. So our overall goal was to identify knowledge gaps and aspects of the Ivra natural environment on which local communities would like us to focus our uh, future knowledge gathering programs, as Fidelma mentioned. And in order to do this, we wanted to focus on the relationship between local communities and the environment. So we decided to focus on these aspects of that relationship just turn on my pointer so you can see it's kind of a reciprocal relationship with local communities having knowledge and interactions with the natural environment and then the environment influencing the well-being of communities and providing opportunities for sustainable tourism and obviously this relationship is much more complex and nuanced than we could ever hope to encapsulate in one study but uh, we thought this would be a great starting point and in the survey, we um, provided a map for participants. You can see it here. And we asked them to link their answers to this map. So when we would ask them, for example, what do you know a lot about in the environment? They could say, for example, I know a lot about migratory birds in Region 15, or I'd like to know more about marine life in Region 20, and so on. And just to explain this map a little bit more, these boundaries we got them based on the townlands and electoral divisions in the area. And we also had um, some feedback from locals just to make sure that the map reflected the reality on the ground. Um, so how did we formulate the survey questions? I thought might be nice to explain the reasoning behind the questions. And if you look back at this slide really quick, you can see these were the dimensions we focused on and they are reflected in our research questions. So we wanted to focus on environmental knowledge um, how the environment influences well-being, how communities interact with their environment, and how they think they could take better advantage of the environment for sustainable tourism. And these are the questions we asked in the survey. Um, so for example, we asked people what they know a lot about, what they'd like to learn more about, and whether they felt any barriers to learning more about their environment. Um, also how the environment might influence their economic and personal well-being or sense of pride in the area and so on. So before I continue on to sharing the survey results, I also want to take a moment to emphasize the fact that the results are based on information that real local people shared with us kindly in the survey. So it's not like me explaining or saying anything about the region. This is, this is um, information based on you know, the perceptions and knowledge of local people. So I thought it might be nice to give an overview of the types of individuals and people um, that took the survey. So you can see here the male to female proportion, um, the age groups, and the main locations that participants were based in. Um, and looking at these, you can kind of tell that they're not very even. Um, so for example, you have way more female participants. The majority of participants were between 45 and 64 years old, and also from Caribbean and Cahersavine. And of course, this will affect the survey results, but it's also good for us to know um, because this way we can put more effort into targeting underrepresented groups, such as young people or people from other smaller communities. So it doesn't always have to be that thing. And people who took the survey might remember that there was a couple questions on what stakeholder groups they identify with and what they prioritize in the region. Um, so for example, we have community, farming and agriculture, government, local business, and so on. And we also asked people what their priorities were in the region. And this is a table of that. And it looks kind of intimidating, but it's pretty easy to get when I explain it. So for example, people, 97% um, of people who identified with community as a stakeholder group also prioritized the environment versus let's say 68% of people who identified with community would also prioritize tourism. So it's kind of interesting to see um, what is important to what kind of groups. 
And also just one final thing, um, the survey results, they're in no way completely representative of everyone in the area. It's mainly just to give us um, a general insight and a foundation to build and expand upon um, for our future programs. So if you don't see yourself in these results, it doesn't mean we're excluding you. If anything, we'd like to hear more from you. So this is um, the two main things we focused on in the survey was environmental knowledge and knowledge gaps. And these maps show the locations and types of things that people know or want to know more about. And each point represents one unit or piece of knowledge. So for example, if someone said, I know a lot about Curlew in this area, that would be one point. But if someone would say, I know about marine life and also migratory birds, that would be two things because they're two separate things they want to know about. And so people's answers to these questions fell into four broad categories. And here they are. So there's specific species, which is light green. Then there's general wildlife, which is dark green. Oh, and just to give an example, specific species could be like curlew, um, red geese, dolphins, and so forth. And general wildlife would be more broad, like bird life, and marine life, plant life, and so on. And then the next category would be natural features, which includes things like mountains, rivers, um, the ocean and nature, tra nature trails. And then the last category was cultural aspects of the environment. So that could include things like cultural connections to nature, Irish words for nature, and so forth. And putting these maps side to side lets us see the similarities and differences between people's knowledge. So um, for example, here you can see there's like a nice spread of different kinds of information that people know about. But then when you look here, then you can see that there is an overwhelming number of cultural aspects people want to know more about in the environment. And because we use maps, we know which specific places people want to know these things in. So that's where um, maps comes in handy. And then I would also like to share with you the top three answers that people gave for these two questions, for what they know about and want to know more about. Um, and that's based on the four categories that I mentioned. So. For things people know a lot about, the most frequent things mentioned, let's say for specific species would be like the chuff, curlew and seaweed, and then so forth for general wildlife, including birds and marine life. And then also for natural features, we have the coast, geology, and then cultural aspects would be heritage, archeology span and local history. And we can compare that with things that people want to know more about. And these were the top three things from each category. Um, the natter jack toad was very popular with a lot of people, as was the carry lily. And then at Borzia de la Pie, some of you might have heard about it. It's this tiny anemone that is only found in Valencia Harbor and nowhere else in the world. So it's very unique, but not much known as known about it. And then for general wildlife, people would like to know more about marine life and plant life. And then natural features would include more about the coast, the dark skies and geology and cultural aspects include more about archaeology. Irish names for nature and cultural links to nature. And then, um, so using these maps, we can see different patterns that emerge. Um, so I'm gonna share some maps with you and you'll see what I mean and why the maps come in handy. So these maps are called heat maps. And if you recall in the last slide, there were maps that were full of points. And these maps are very similar, except they show the concentration of those points across different areas. So for example, dark areas would have a higher concentration of points and later areas would have a lower concentration of points. And um, so it's just another way of visualizing the data. And then these heat maps um, reflect answers to the other survey questions on how the environment influences economic, personal well-being, sense of pride in one's local area and how people interact with the environment through outdoor recreation. So when we put all these maps together, then we can kind of start to see different patterns that might come up um, that we wouldn't see without the maps. So I'll give you some examples here. Um, in these three maps, so personal well-being, sense of pride, and natural features, you can see that there's a very distinct pattern all around the coast that you don't get in the other maps. So something we might um, interpret from this would be to that like coastal features have a, a very strong influence on well-being and sense of pride. Another example here in the um, south coast, there is a link between specific species and general wildlife and outdoor recreation. So we might understand this by thinking that outdoor activities that people participate in are very closely linked to um, wildlife. 
And then another pattern here, it's not a similarity, but rather a difference. So you can see here, the environment doesn't have a very strong influence on um, economic well-being, but it does very much so on personal well-being. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see the difference that economic and personal well-being are not necessarily um, very closely linked when it comes to the environment. And then I also asked people if they felt any barriers to learning more about the, their environment. And from all the answers, these were the main themes that came up. The, the biggest theme, I think, was that people mentioned that there was a big lack of accessible knowledge on the environment. So this would mean that either there was no information at all or there was too much really high level specific information. So for example, this um, survey respondent said, they're only generally interested in the environment and they need more general knowledge, not specific knowledge. Um, so it's useful for us to know this. So that way we can um, create more general knowledge on the environment. So it helps people get like a foot in the door into learning more rather than like really special, highly like hard to understand um, information. And then you can see some other quotes here. For example, uh, one person would say that there might need to be better communication among different projects in the EVRA. And then finally, the last question I asked was, how do you feel your local community could take better advantage of its natural environment for sustainable off-season tourism? And these were the top six um, suggestions that people gave. So just to review, it would be marketing and promotion of natural and cultural assets, promotion of outdoor activities, promotion of the dark skies, local festivals and workshops, nature trails and guided walks, and um, tourism resources. And then lastly, this map looks pretty crazy also. Um, it's the same map as it, the answers for this question of off-season tourism. And these are all the suggestions that everyone gave, except this is like a mind map um, overlaid on top of a geographical map. And it allows us to see which communities made which suggestions. And it's a really great way of linking suggestions to specific communities so that we can use this info to tailor our initiatives and programs to those communities rather than taking a one size fits all approach. Um, I won't read all of it, but for example, let's say in Valencia, people suggested art weekends, just embracing the winter weather, promoting outdoor activities and more interactive resources. Whereas um, over here in Derrynan, people also said festivals and in other places, it's more specific. So in Sneem, someone would say creating the Sneem story house. Um, so it's just nice to see all the differences. And then lastly, what can we do with this information going forward? Um, firstly, it helps us understand the relationship between local communities and the natural environment, as I mentioned in the first slide. Um, also creating tailored engagement initiatives, as I mentioned in the last slide, with like the specific communities. And finally, and most importantly, it'll guide our future knowledge gathering programs that are responsive to the diverse needs, resources, audiences, and perceptions present across the EVRA. And this is just a nice little visual that makes sense of all of this. So this survey was part of this first step of gathering local knowledge, and this would be the last step. And everything in between is going to be guided by information that we collected in the survey. Um, that is it. Gaurav Mahagat, thank you so much for listening. And I will pass it over to Lucy. Hi, everyone again. And thank you so much, Sally. That was lovely. It's uh, the second or third time we've heard that, and it's still interesting, and I'm still noticing things uh, <laughs> that I didn't see before. Um, so just before we move into Q&A, there are tons of things coming through in the, the chat, um, which is great. Just to say that this really is the entire survey is really just a snapshot. And what we've seen is just a snapshot of that survey. But there's so much in those results that are going to be really, really useful for us um, within this project. Um, the whole, you know, the, the, this recording will go up online. Sally's working on a report. Um, and all of the, the, the data will be obviously completely anonymized, but will be available and accessible um, along with all of the outputs of the live project. So um, if there are ways that other projects can use it or that it can be useful for their initiatives, um, we'd love to hear about that as well. Um, as Fadama noted, this was really done to, to underpin the knowledge gathering programs that will be run within LIVE. Um, and just to say that there is currently 
um, well, we have currently vacancies for knowledge gatherers and we have extended the deadline for applications to midday next Tuesday. So um, please do visit the website and have a look at the job description there. And if you know anyone who'd like to apply, feel free to share. Um, they're, they're kind of very general, the, the roles at the moment, because we wanted to wait for this sort of information like what Sally has for us to really be able to tailor the programs that we deliver within the project. Um, it's very interesting to look at the, the gaps and the overlaps between what people are interested in and what they'd like to know more about and what they already feel they know a lot about. Um, in some cases, there's a, a, a complete knowledge gap there that there's something people are really interested in and there's just very little known locally or academically or you know there's just not very much information about it. And in other cases, it's there is a lot of information and perhaps it just hasn't been presented correctly or communicated widely. And that's something that we need to look at as well within this project um, to see where it's just a case of sharing or communicating something differently. Um, as well as those knowledge gathering programs, Sally's touched on the other questions that she asked. And there are some very clear comments in there that will inform our ways of working as well. I mean, one that stands out from the presentation is the fact that there are so many projects ongoing locally. Um, and Anish has already put a message in the chat talking about a, a project that has ended that could also feed into something like this. And that's something that's very important to us is to try not to just you know, add another layer of activity, but to, to do our best to work together with what's, what's already out there and to align what we do with other people as well. And on the tourism side, she's given a great rundown of the kinds of suggestions that people had, um, some of people's concerns and feelings about tourism. And these will really help to uh, direct us in terms of the outputs that we focus on as well. Um, not completely, because there are other voices that mightn't have been represented in this survey that we're also listening to, but it's it's really, really essential um, as a part of that. So that's how we are going to put this information into action. Um, if you have any questions, please do raise your hand. You can do that by clicking on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and raising your hand or putting um, a question in the chat box. Um, I'm just scrolling through there to see the, the questions that have already been asked as well. Um, there was one actually about the, the total number of respondents, Sally. I've said in the chat that it was about 80. Could you confirm? The number? Yeah, it was exactly 80. Exactly 80. Okay. Um, great. And there are so many here. Sorry, I'm scrolling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are some comments as well about data. So thank you for those. Um, Vinny, I'm not sure how to answer that question about um activities already taking place and how that's influenced it um yeah i was just wondering from that perspective just um uh you know in the area here yeah um and looking back maybe over the last 10, 10 years but particularly in the last five years a lot of the um uh the uh, the points raised and i think the the, la the third last slide on the map there between nature trails, themed breaks, well, the Greenway, no, but Dark Sky Reserve, active retirement, tourism infrastructure, flexibility around weather, uh, with the exception of promoting the Caradaniel River, which is uh, a thing that's ongoing, mm. uh, promoting events and attractions and centralised tourism resource guided walks, local area maps. All, all of that has been here um, and developed, you know, in the last 10 years between the OPW and myself and others. And... Um, I just wonder how much that has influenced people's say, you know, perception um, of the results that are shown here. Um, you know, how many people uh, responded in that way, if if you know what I mean, from the Car Daniel area. I saw in, in one of the earlier slides, I think over the front, um, that Car Daniel was probably uh, the best represented. Would that be right? Um, yeah, it was um, Car Daniel and Car Sabine. Were yeah the yeah. most respondents were from there yeah and 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 then you know when you look at Car Carazavine and then you look at actually the you know uh the joining up the kind of the lines along the coast um it's possibly the fact that there are central fo focuses in Car Carazavine out to the Skelly coast uh into Waterville and then into Car Daniel Ken Kenmare Bay so you might infer from that that uh people people are maybe aware 
of what's available um, and want more or, you know, want certain, certain things. I mean, I suppose the obvious thing for me in all of this is that when you look inland, there's a lot of work to be done in there and um, back into, uh, you know, the valleys and uh, yeah. uh, those areas which are fairly underrepresented. And they actually are some of the most amazing spaces in all of Ivora. So thanks. Uh, really good presentation. Thank you. There are good points, Finney, and there. I guess it's difficult for us to to know what has caused people to answer in the way yeah. that they have. But they're good points to to note. Yeah. Also, just to touch to just to touch on the last point you made, um, about the inland areas, um, there was not that much information that we got from participants from the inland areas, but no information still means something. So it just means that we need to target those areas maybe more effectively or through other means. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a just add in there that you know the ability to look at this information on that sort of fine scale geographic um distribution really gives it a, so much more power, you know. So looking at those areas where you know where most of the respondents had come from and looking at areas, yeah, where where there, you know, there were maybe huge gender biases or huge mm -hmm. age biases. Uh, really, what you know will will give us a lot of, um, I suppose, a lot of thought about how you know how we all should, um, you know, approach other projects and other work. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, it's a good point. There's a, it's similar to a comment that's been made here in the chat about um, how online surveys can differ from real life and how that may have affected what you've gathered, um, and about problems with digital exclusion or um, the results that you've got. Would you like to comment on that at all, Sally, with how, how you think that might have affected the results or how you... Yeah, to... um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously doing something online versus in person is not the same, um, but we, we just couldn't meet anyone in person. So we had to do it online, but including the maps um, was just another way to maybe try to make it a little more engaging and participatory rather than just straight questions. Um, I had done a similar study in the past before COVID that was like more in-depth interviews with um, community members in around Cork Harbour. Um, and that was nicer because you get the people to like draw on maps themselves. And um, so there are a lot of different ways of doing it. It's just that we had um, constraints with the, with the restrictions. I think we were surprised at the ages as well though, that it was, um, it yeah. was more similar to what we would have expected from face-to-face -face ages um, than, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, older people won't be interested in doing a, a survey online or, but I think it was, it was um, the middle batch that of, of, of age that was most common, but there were people who were in the older categories who did complete the survey. And we did offer other options as well, um, which weren't picked up on, but we did offer to post people out surveys. Um, or provide other ways for, for completing it. Um, so something that we maybe could look at more in the future as well, but yeah. Um, is there anything else that anyone would like to comment on or anything that I've missed that you'd like to, to draw my attention to? Um, oh, Eleanor, sorry. Um, do you think that accessibility of areas is impacted? Oh yes, okay, that's an interesting question. But the coastline is very accessible to the public, but inland habitats often require permission to access privately on land. It's an interesting question. I don't know if you have a comment to add to that. So. Um, not, not too in-depth, but when we asked people if they faced any barriers to learning more about their environment, this was something that was brought up in a lot of responses was the fact that access to nature is so restricted. And if people can't go visit sites, then obviously it's really hard to learn about them. So that is that is something that came up quite often. Mm. Yeah. Um, Pat, you've got your hand up there. Would you like to unmute? and ask your question. There are just two things I'd like to say, that there's a big movement here in the Rye area of, uh, regarding the restoration of the Irish language. And Victor Bida is piloting that, but uh, there are lots of classes taking place, lots of Kirkland Koraws and that. So, Mm -hmm. That's very positive because this is an area steeped in the Irish language and especially in the storytelling 
tradition of the Irish language. And it, it was from here that the folklore department really uh, originated because of Laura Hany Cunham. So that's one aspect that I just wanted to raise. And the other thing is that, that uh, Michael Kirby was a, a local writer from here mm -hmm. and uh, he died in 2005, but he started writing late in life and in all he had 11 books published, eight in the Irish language and three in English. And his most recent book, um, which was published in 2019, was actually uh, one of the launchings was in UCC. But his entire archive is in UCC. Uh, so I just, he has written a lot about this area. Mm. So just, I don't think the archive has been catalogued yet, but just to know that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thanks for those points, Pat. I'm, I'm not sure um, Sally's best place to, to comment on those, but... <laughs> well, I'll just say yeah. that, like, the, that, that's the biggest, um, that's really mm -hmm. the biggest thing I took away from the survey results, but was that, mo like, most everyone wants um, to know more about and read more about um, the cultural connections to nature. Mm -hmm. that, that, yeah. 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 And, and can I just maybe put in there that... You know the the focus. I suppose the primary focus of our of the life project is the natural heritage. You know, so around the, as I say, the flora, fauna, and geology, and that really is because I suppose we had to cut our cloth to our measure. You know, when we when we um, when we applied for the project, you know, and set out our stall. So mm -hmm. so it's not that we're excluding those things, but I guess. Um, where they arise in relation to, you know, where, where culture and, and literature, where those things arise in relation to, to natural capital, um, you know, we will certainly explore mm -hmm. that a wee bit. Yeah, of course, we would love to. Yeah. Yeah, if there are other conversations we had, I mean, I was talking to another woman this morning just about trying to, as you kind of say, maybe get things digitized, maybe just even have links to them from local places so that people know that they can access them, even if it's just online. Um, you know, please feel free to get in touch again, Pat, if you want to discuss it a little bit more. Um, yeah, Vinny's put the name there. I definitely have Skellig's Calling. My granddad is a big fan of Michael Kirby, so I've got all the books. Um, and then a question about over tourism and effects on environment, species, disturbance. Um, you're right, it was not explicitly in the survey, but we were wondering would people give responses? in a negative way to tourism or, or even mention places where they didn't want more tourists. So maybe Sally, you could, could speak to that. Um, I mean, when I asked people about like there's suggestions for off season tourism, there were a couple of people that said, actually, I don't think we need um, tourism in the off season. I, the summer is enough. Um, but there wasn't much more elaboration on that because the survey um, focused more on environmental knowledge than the tourism side of things. Um, but it certainly is something um, that we will keep on the radar because it is it is a big part of the impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the in the project in general, it's definitely part of the focus. Um, I know Arwell is here as well, and it's very much their focus in Wales as well. Our Welsh partner is looking at at those sort of impacts. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, Vinny here again. Um, just um, part of what's called the uh, the Coastal Communities Group. Uh, now, which uh, was formed recently, um, stemmed from um, all the work that uh, people in the Maharese have done in terms mm. of climate impacts on 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 uh, the Tombola there, uh, and also then in the context of uh, you know to tourism uh, effectively shutting their place down uh, and also affecting habitats and special species and stuff like that. So. Um, that ongoing uh, movement, so to call it, uh, it stretches from the north of Ireland all the, all the way around uh, east coast, south coast, west coast, and up to Donegal. And um, for anybody that wants to jo join uh, in that group or conversations from the coast here, please uh, just send me an email or PM me on um, any of the social media sites that, that I run. And I'll let you know when the next meetings uh, for that group are and you can join in. Uh, on, on the Zoom, it's it's really important. Uh, we need it's something we need to address, and I know personally I'm I'm dreading uh, this summer. I think it's going to be the summer of all summers that's just going to completely destroy Derry and Anne. 
Uh, but that's that's the way it is at the moment. We'll just have to live and learn and then maybe plan for it uh, over time. And I think this project is vital for that. So thank you. If, yeah, if there's any um, any way that we can provide knowledge to underpin, again, we keep saying that word, that would be very much the focus of this project. But um, if and if you'd like to add any links or anything like that, any into the chat box for people's information. You could do yeah, that I'll, I'll, um, I'll just give the team details here and um, my email anyway yeah sure add it in there and you know this way of presenting information that sort of map based way um is also a good way to inform you know things like responsible development isn't it mm. you know and they will can open up the conversation about responsible tourism development mm. um i this might be a bit mean on our well I'm, don't think you plan to do this, but would you like to say a few words about the work that Solly did for you guys over in, in Wales? Yeah, um, I was uh, I just going to message you now uh, just to say that uh, on the back of what Vincent was saying, I've shared uh, a video with yourselves on the reopening of the National Park in Snowdonia last summer. Mm -hmm. um, um, very similar issues there with what Vincent raised. And it's quite interesting going into this year how they've addressed that. So they've put in, um, you've, got, you've got to book uh, parking spaces in uh, the National Park 24 hours beforehand in the, up in the mountains. So you can just park, uh, come, come in and just park up and pay at the pay and display. Um, they put on more um, park and ride buses um, they've increased the parking costs to cover those costs as well. So it's a sustainable model, um, looking at electric buses and so on as well. So it seems to me that uh, last year's forced issue uh, over here. And um, obviously we have similar issues down on the peninsula as well. So we, you know, we, we will be trying to tackle those. But um Coming back to your point, we're very interested in the work Solly has done. She's she's had a bit of a go at uh, doing some something similar for us with with a bit of information I provided, which was really really powerful because it's so visual, and possibly we can develop that over the summer again. Um, but yeah, I think over tourism, I think people we just need to get a handle of. What, what people want to see and what people are comfortable with. And if we are going to create jobs within tourism, they have to be keeping people in those communities all year round. Otherwise it's just been extracted out of the area. And I think that's that's the learning that we that, that we have over here. People are, you know, not looking at the same numbers of people, but looking at models where they can attract people uh, in a sustainable way to the area out of sea. We're losing you there, Arvon. Well. Where they come for this, you know, it's the walking off of the, the wildlife and the dark skies. Um, okay, I think that's plenty from <laughs> me. But uh, yeah, hopefully that's achieved with the project. Um, we lost you slightly there, Arvon, but, but I think a point well made. Um, so yeah, it, it is definitely a hot topic all around, all around the world, really, I think. Um, there's one more question here um, in the, the chat and I'm conscious that um, we don't want to keep people for too long um, but it's saying that the study focused very much on locals and have we looked into what visitors would like to know more about um, and do we think they would be interested in similar themes or areas for B yeah <laughs> <laughs> um I think that is an excellent idea. I think we just wanted first to get an insight into, you know, the perceptions of locals. Um, and also like because of, of COVID, I think it would be super, super hard to to get in contact with tourists because or because there isn't really visitors in the Eva right now. But um, maybe over the summer or next summer, it would be a really interesting. Um, maybe we could do the same thing with maps in that we could ask people like where their favorite areas are. And if there's places with like a huge number of people going and there's places that are just as beautiful, but not many people going, then it'd be interesting maybe to kind of 
promote those areas. So you kind of like spread the pressure because there's only so much that the environment can carry. Um, so yeah, yeah, there is there is a capacity for doing that as well. Yeah. And um, also there's, there's an issue, sorry, you see, there's also an issue there about what tourists you ask also, isn't there? So tourists that yeah. come in the summer and maybe tourists that come in the autumn or the winter are probably very different sorts of tourists. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, just, it's another good point. And I, and I suppose that's that's what this project is trying to not attract more tourists in August. Um, yeah. so I, it is can I just say about um, surveying the tourists and the tourists all have to stay somewhere. So maybe yeah. if you put some sort of paper surveys in all of the hotels and B&Bs, then you can get a good spread of data on them. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We need to, to work with visitors when we have them, I suppose. Thanks, Cam. Um, so, yeah. Um, there are some other comments in the chat there. I see lots, lots of um, offers for certain things, and, and we will download the chat and maybe respond to certain ones in time. Um, Dee, your question is really interesting about an argument for guided interaction with certain habitats. Yeah. I think it's possibly out of the scope of, of maybe what we can cover in this discussion, but I think it's really clear that there's there's room for us to discuss these things an awful lot more. Um, so I might say that we we might have a whole separate meeting about, about all of these things. Um, because yeah, I, I think um once we have the, the full set of Sally's data and report, it could possibly inform discussions like that as well. Um, and we're probably not going to create policy, but there's certainly um an argument that we could influence things or provide knowledge that that could um feed into that. Um, just, can I just um, say one thing related to that? I think just going back to like the whole thing with the maps, I think yeah. maps are a really, really good way of visualizing the sort of intangible knowledge. Um, so especially in terms of like policy making, decision making, because if you just try to say or present something to um, policymakers, um, it might be kind of hard for them to incorporate this kind of knowledge into account. But if you like provide like you know solid tangible maps it just makes it so much easier to see not only what but where yeah and so how much yeah and how much yeah. yeah 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 um and paul has messaged me there about another project we've spoken on the phone actually about that paul so <laughs> it'd be great to follow up again um i I think we'll finish it up there. There don't seem to be any new questions coming in about the survey as such. Before we finish, I would like to share what for us is very sad news. Um, but Sally is actually finishing up on the live project next week and is heading off to Pastures New. She's been accepted for a PhD. Um, and the work that she's done so far has been so valuable for us. And we're, we're really grateful that we managed to, to meet her and bring her into the project. <laughs> Um, and I'm kind of hoping we'll somehow figure out how to use her skills in the future as well. <laughs> um, but massive congratulations, Sally. And Thank you. Um, we are going to miss you an awful lot in the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll keep in touch. I think there's a lot yes. more, um, a lot more to be done here. So for sure. Thank you very much. And uh Ah, you're getting lovely messages. Thank you for in the all the I hope comments. you're reading those. As I well. don't know you, but thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's very sweet of everyone. Thank you. Yeah, obviously it would have been a very different experience if um, we could have all been out and about and in person yeah. talking. But um, yeah, it's it's been great having you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, and we'll follow up with people um, a lot more afterwards as well. So thank you so much for all the comments. We'll save them and we'll get back to all of you. And we'll still be here. So. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very Bye. much. Bye. See you later. Bye.